Okay, I think we're good to go. Good evening. My name is Tony Brewer, and I'm a co-producer of the Writers Guild at Bloomington Spoken Word Series. This is our uh, March 3rd installment. This is a monthly series that we have been, uh, we had been doing live in person. Excuse me, let me uh, mute something. Good evening. Mute something here, there we go. Um, had been doing in person prior to lockdown a year ago. Um, but we have continued on as a, um, as a Zoom event, as an online event. And we're thrilled that you could be here. We are sponsored in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. The Writers Guild at Bloomington wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University and the city of Bloomington were built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Uh, before we get into our uh, readers and music this evening, uh, just had a couple of notes um, for uh, for the Writers Guild. Uh, Third Sunday Right is our uh, ongoing workshop. If you are interested in, receive, in receiving monthly prompts and having a friendly place to share your writing responses and read the work of others, email Shauna Ritter and her address will be is available on our website to get invited to a uh, private Facebook group uh, called Third Sunday Right. This is an ongoing workshop um, that uh, again gathers monthly. Um, also our monthly business meeting, which is all business. Uh, we don't talk too much about writing, mostly talk about events like this one and other special projects that we do throughout the year. And that next meeting is Saturday, March 27th, uh, three o'clock via Zoom. Contact the Writers Guild for the link. And uh, our website is where you can find out uh, all of these things and more. Also an opportunity to donate to us, a deserving 501c3 not-for-profit, as well as sign up for our newsletter. Uh, Joan Hawkins, the chair of the guild does a fantastic job putting together a, a newsletter um, and you would do yourself a great service if you were to sign up for it our website our uh, url is writers guild bloomington all one word writers guild bloomington.com and we also uh, urge you to check out our various social media uh, platforms we're on facebook we're on instagram uh, we're on twitter and we have a, a YouTube channel now where we are slowly populating. Uh, well, I am rapidly populating it with um, events like this. We're, we're trying to migrate all of our uh, videos uh, from Facebook onto YouTube as well. A little easier to find things there. So we have a, a fantastic lineup for this evening on uh, saxophone Sam Newsom and three fantastic poets, Brooke Nicole Plummer. Uh, Bree Joanne and Steve Hinn. Brooke and Steve both have uh, new books out, at least uh, within the last uh, month or so, and we will hear from them in just a moment. First, we're going to hear from Sam Newsom, an innovator of unconventional sounds on his instrument. Sam Newsom has evolved as one of the most important soprano saxophonists in improvised music. Since 2007, Sam has released six groundbreaking solo saxophone recordings that push the boundaries of his instrument. Albums Blue Soliloquy and Sopranoville both re received five stars in Downbeat Magazine. He's a recipient of the 2016 um, uh, New York FA Fellowship and the 2020 Instant Award in Improvised Music. Sam works with uh, many genre-stretching musicians on today's improvised music scene. He has released over 20 recordings as a leader and has repaired, has appeared on over 40 as a sideman. Uh, I'll put his link in the chat and over on Facebook. Please welcome Sam Newsom. Thank <laughs> you. 
Wonderful, fantastic. Thank you, Sam Newsom. We will hear some more of Sam a little later. Right now we're gonna do a round robin of our three poets this evening. Uh, first up is Brooke Nicole Plummer. Brooke Nicole Plummer is a writer musician from the Midwest region. Her first full length collection of poems, Flyover, Compiled Nothings was self-published in November of 2018. Her second chapbook, Shaggy Frog, was just released in January through Alien Buddha Press. As a performance artist, she goes by The Rotten Fruit. And again, I'll put her URL in the chat and over on, on uh, Facebook. Please welcome Brooke Nicole Plummer. All right. 
Hello, everybody. Um, to start off, I'm going to read from my first chat book, Flyover Compiled Nothings. And then uh, a few other ones that are not in the book. So to start off, this is called Midwestern Swagger. The medallion of flatlands, smoke of Turkish blend and fertilizer, elks rubbernecking traffic, bullet casings and the knots of wild flowers. Bud like caps and golden blazoned fields convey the area code, but acres away from all the asphalt, it is quiet. A tire swing sways gently near a house that nurtured several generations, some of which developed a penchant for poetry, matured into the habit of belt lashing neurotransmitters into action. The way my great grandparents did on my tailbone when I forgot to, to collect scraps for the strays or made myself purposely lost in the vineyard with a two track mind from treasures to textuality. Now, one track commemorates, the other accelerates its own quirks, like popping a bubble with big red over the Gutenberg Bible, igniting bottle rockets inside ramshackle sheds, or adorning properties with wreaths made of twigs and the bare craniums of white airs. Audrey Grace palm spinning a loaded rifle. A ramshackle unit on Kelly Road. Outdoors, low voltage fireflies coruscate. Indoors, cinnamon incense burn at the tip and harmonica swells bounce around alabaster wallpaper. Audrey Grace, I encourage you to have all possible verbs first-handed. I'm on your side. Our relief involves breathing through energy renewed, canned at 24 ounces or similar to great preserved sustenance. We could display ourselves for the world like a child's finger painting, sloppy and sure. warming wrists. There are lessons embedded in fractures, haloed by a seeking for solace in love and hazily hoping like incandescents hanging purple reflections on beds of snow as the mind flutters like dozens of moths in an armoire enabled to splatter papers with a left brained magnum without mercy, without a method for returning. Michigan City, 1999. I brought my Capri son with me when I walked to the bow of a sailboat. The seagulls, the seagulls cawed dissonantly. I watched them white plumaged aerodynamics. I watched them cross-legged and serene. Mother, could you feel the wind dancing across your cosmetics or taste the fumes of blue mass splashing, elevating us to timelessness? I remember learning Miss Susie from you and thinking the East Pierhead Lighthouse was an emporium for candy canes, a landmark for return. And your returnal is no longer marked by land. It is the spirit of a poem. Penn Township Revelation. We are still young, vertebrae, vertebrae like silly putty and it will all be used up. Pupils like tumbleweed on a stimulant, delirium with a body length. 
The livestock are surveying morning light. It's a sign of their continuum. They graze like paper cutouts from the juvenile section. We talk like sugar cookie dough by the spoonful, eggshells indiscreetly folded in. I heighten myself into calculated disembodiment, like dreamily underwater. I want to be somebody's muddy diamond. And this will be the last one I read from my first chat book. Has no title. Landlocked with dry husks, particles of light beaming over nowhere. I have effaced myself to float around a line break, floating gently like a favor while being unidentifiable, a time honored ritual. I allow the earth to clasp me, clasp me. Her attention is the taste of rose water. Velvet darkness. After looking at the Hart Crane Memorial structure, I vomited into the Cuyahoga River because I ate too much cannoli at Sayanados. Even with a broken foot, I climbed Brandywine trails to look down upon boulders the size of Megalodon skulls, which are landscaping rust belt conservation areas. One of my worst fears is being too faint of heart in regards to myself. A raccoon scuttered into pink shrubbery. It can feel the rain without getting wet. I need the same ancient intuition, like Emersonian ink being a lifestyle of velvet darkness. Waterfall ring toss. I am running toward who I can become, running away from how I can turn out, running into festively. The conductor of numerous aspire, Sappho's wet dreams scrutinized with brain matter rimmed with the citadel of dark emphasis. I want your stare sunken into mine throughout our obliterations and such capable proficiencies. And this will be my, uh, my last one for this round. It's called Obsidian. A throne is nothing less than the will, my control, a bent hook, a lukewarm teacup, adjectives that describe faults, but the objects are in form and the means to be described as something occupying space, which is why I channel the authors in burial grounds. Their axioms rise from the lithosphere to be captured and shelved in used bookstores. A few crinkled bills for a stack of them, which is good news for the heavy-eyed proletariat. When the stars burn themselves onto the roof, there's a voracious appetite for filling paper. It helps flicker the bulb of understanding so that I, a tiny pocket of obsidian, can recommence to some order a sparrow flying vertical to tree sap goes undisturbed by these things. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Brooke. 
we'll have uh, Brooke back for, uh, for another round in a little bit. Next, I want to welcome Steve Hinn. Steve Hinn wrote Indiana Noble Sad Man of the Year from Wolfson Press in 2017. And God said, let there be evolution, NYQ Books 2012, and Unacknowledged Legislations, NYQ Books 2011. And he's the author of the brand new chapbook from Main Street Rag, Guilty Prayer, I think just came out in January. He has been featured in the Long Beach Poetry Festival, the Uptown Poetry Slam, um, IU South Bend Visiting Writer Series, uh, the University of Pittsburgh Greensburg, the Dive Dapper Carnival Poetry Showcase, and elsewhere. He raises the four children of he and the late artist Lydia Francis Hinn, 1980 to 2013, and teaches in Indiana. Please welcome Steve Hinn. Hey, everybody. Good to see you here. Good to see some of my friends in the um, in the chat room there. Uh, this is my new chat book. That uh, cover art is by Lydia Hen, my kid's mom. And uh, the first poem I'm going to read out of Guilty Prayer is called Bar Talk. The death panels were always here, desecrated with crepe paper and magic marker messages. Welcome aboard. No one here gets out alive. Red-blooded American Jesus giggles and goes back to masturbating. There's a hole in the wall in the Mayo Clinic leading to an honest afterlife, the one the deep state keeps from us. I traveled many moons by Stargate and by Hitch and Crick to hear this secret on the winds of trade. It doesn't take a man from Mensa to tell us Bono preaches endlessly, but I just told my old bar pal I'd ignored it. So I struggle still for progress, not perfection. Ice tea, who we? There's music in my monologue. There's silence in the neon trees. And everything I know about you is a thing somebody, Bono or God, Madonna or your mama, knows too clearly, queerly, preciously, too dearly. Do I fear thee? Have a beer on me. That's the first one. weird when you can't hear an audience but we'll get through it and this next poem I definitely committed a crime it's called still life with ceiling fan and user's guilt after staring at a screen too long my brain wants a ceiling fan arms perpetuating like half thoughts shimmering never absent never there or when you open a single car window and the sound shimmers, a psychedelic effect, all the annoyance of highness and none of the pleasantry. For years, I wanted to be released of mundane sanities by hallucination and buzz. Now all I want is to think quickly and clearly as possible. And may all the authorities forgive me my trespasses. I pissed on a grave once. In upstate New York, of course I was high. My friend knew better, a random man yelled at us. It's just one of those things which never was funny and proves I'm an asshole. I pissed on a grave and I can't take it back, drunk and high and all out of whack. Not that excuses excuse me. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's that one. This one is kind of disturbing. I don't, I don't read this out often. I like the end of it, but it's a little freaky. What goes on in this poem? It's called Trimming an Earlobe, and it's a true story. I remember when you were pregnant with our oldest. Once you knew you quit wine, quit everything cold turkey. Then in your mother's bathroom mirror in newly sober psychosis, Looking at your earlobes, thinking they needed a trim, you raised a pair of scissors and cut the left lobe off. That time, I did come to comfort you. You wouldn't hear of going to a hospital. I hated psych wards, but knew you weren't well. You talked yourself into willing yourself to normalcy. 
For years, it worried you that my mother might ask about that side of your head. It's asynchronicity. We kept the lobe in a pill vial nearly into our kid's second year. Before tossing it out the torus window, we opened for a look. It was black and disgusting. It stunk. Why did we keep this? We laughed and laughed together because things were good between us. And that was an old life when we were our lesser selves. It was the fabled past. We were never going back. Things would only get better. We were on a country road shouting at cows with our one-year-old hilariously and things would only get better. And things would only get better some more. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I'm doing on time. And I don't want to overstay. So uh, I think this will be my last one for this round. Um, this is, this is a, a, a poem in response to a, a threat my son received on Instagram last April, uh, not long after he came out as trans. And it's called Poem for Austin, the boy who threatened to kill my son on social media. Luke played two parts in the school play, a comedy about Greek mythology. Achilles, the nearly indestructible warrior, and man, as in kind. If you could have seen how authentically he accepted the manhood granted by Prometheus, how knowingly he popped the footrest on the dad chair stage right, cheekily commanding Pandora to make me dinner, woman. If you could have seen how happily he flitted Trojan to Trojan, touching each with a plastic sword so they'd swoon and fall and die like straight men playing dead, as only brothers would. Perhaps you would have clapped or laughed, or as you sat there scowling, while a boy you insist cannot be a boy, carried himself proudly across the stage in lights, perhaps you would have understood how unnecessary it is to threaten another child on Instagram, how you never actually had to message him, to insist he could never be the one thing. He's always in his heart's core, in his heart of hearts, known himself to be. That's all I got. Thanks, Steve. Always appreciate your work and congratulations on the new book. Last up in this first round, I want to welcome Bree Joanne. Bree Joanne is a writer, artist, and community organizer based in Indianapolis. She's a candidate for Butler's Creative Writing MFA program. She hopes to one day be gifted with high fashion items because she's good at what she does. Bree. Hello. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much for having me, first off, to the Bloomington Writers Guild. And tonight I'm going to be um, reading some selections from small presses that I've um, had work in because it, I imagine us being pretty hard out there for anything small nowadays. So just want to shout them out. Um, while I was looking for these pieces, I found like my weird little bios that I sent. So first here are um, three of my goofy bios. Bree Joanne writes most of her poems on her dated iPhone. She has a super useful fiction writing degree from Columbia College, Chicago. Bree Joanne is a lanky legend from the hood. Her hobbies include playing Mario Kart with her husband, singing 070 Shakes the Pines in the car with her son, and longing for overpriced designer corduroys on the internet. You can't kill beat Bree Joanne. She's a rad witch. She rides straws and lives with her husband and son in Indianapolis, Indiana. She plays with robots and makes memes with teens for a living. So um, next I've got a piece from uh, Peach Mag. Um, I guess Peach is pretty big now, but like when I submitted it was smaller and like 
I just really appreciated them for giving me a platform because like even though they were smaller than what they are now it was still bigger than anything I'd ever had so uh shout out to Peach and Rachel uh yeah so this poem's called Cat City my legs are in black tights and they seem foreign on this antique couch I am undergoing an act that is traditional among my new peers. I want to express myself through Instagram, but the visual language of this place is overwhelming and it's difficult to draw boundaries. Maybe I'll just text someone a series of small phrases. I feel a special tension that I can't ignore. It draws me towards time's true vortex. I am floating in an elite space that is filled with white light. It lacks the conventional sense of gravity. I feel a little dizzy because, I have, because I've been walking rings around a rosy outlook that lacks a conventional sense of cause and effect. I'm the type of person that takes a few bites of a fancy salad, then takes a walk around a garden to decide how I feel. I dance around the empty cylinders at the center of time. I walk around singing Mac DeMarco's Chamber of Reflection in my friend's empty home. Their cat stares me down and I get uncomfortable. So I pet it and allow it to sit in my lap for a while. Um, I've got a piece from Poesis. So Bloomington folks probably know them. They, um, it's Rose Werenberg and Wendy's reading series, um, Syzygy's um, publication. So, and they've got a new one out now and it looks like it's gonna be really awesome. So check that out, Poesis. Uh, this poem's called Wishlist. I want to be an angel in front of the television with no higher priority than anime in my bay. I want to play deck builders in bed with the cards, without the cards burrowing into folds of fabric. I want to gaze at unadorned peaks and valleys, explore a forgotten cemetery and find something familiar. I want my Snoopy pants to come in the mail and my Megan the Stallion cassette tape and the comic that I kickstarted three years ago and the Latvian anthology and the Mark Jacobs top and the APC top. I want to go to my uncle's restaurant in Chicago, then take an Uber to Quimby's books. I want to go to Japan with everyone I'm related to. I want to know the kind of peace that runs deeper than memory, like old money. I want my love to feel like a gift, not emergency backup. I want to buy all the abandoned malls in the country for black teenagers to cover in murals and play laser tag. I want a portal to Narnia to appear in a closed school. I want it to be discovered by locals smoking a blunt right before urban explorers call the cops. I want to go for a fearless 3 a.m. stroll when insomnia strikes and catch my reflection in every darkened window. I want to gently divest myself from my body just so I can offer the admiration that it's always deserved. All right, so um, the last, my last one for my first little round is from the journal Petra, which was which is edited by um, Olivia Kronk. And Olivia Kronk is one of those random people I met on the internet that I can't remember how I met, but I've never met her in person, but I know I love her because she's like, I feel like she's written for me and is a good um, poetry friend. So yeah, anyways, um, this poem's called Payday and it's um, the journalpetra.com. The crystals glow on the windowsill. The smoke from the incense rises. It is cold outside, but the sky is very blue. I'm trying to learn ways to treat myself more effectively so that I don't feel like treating myself so often. I lay on my belly in the sunlight, 
reading short stories about selfish women. I love books about selfish women. I pay two bills online so I feel responsible. Maybe eventually I will fold some clothes. I don't need too many metaphors today, but the ones that I need must be strong. So, yeah. Oh, wait. Actually, I think I have, yeah, I got one more. I forgot I have one more in my, for my first little bit. Um, this one is from the FAF Collective, which is a super awesome publication started by my besties, Ari Attack and Jasmine Spaceyans, um, fafcollective.com. And this poem is called uh, Carol Baskin. And uh, you'll see, soon see why. <laughs> it's got the word bitch a lot. Carol Baskin. Yes, I'm that bitch. I'm that awful entitled bitch who can't be bothered. I'm that bitch that has everybody bothered. I'm that bitch leaving you on red. I'm that bitch stuck in her head. I'm that bitch playing on my phone. I'm that bitch that would rather be alone. I'm that bitch gazing over your head. I'm that bitch idly wondering what you said. I'm that bitch that must confess Despite bitch face, I rarely rest. I'm that bitch that stays on fleek. I'm that bitch that makes you feel bleak. I'm that bitch who is amazed inside. I'm that bitch who's amazing inside. I'm that bitch flexing with the fashion. I'm that bitch trying to share my passions. I'm that bitch that glows up the room. I'm that bitch building castles from a tomb. I'm that bitch taking heads like names. I'm that bitch whose only choice is fame. I'm that bitch keeping the girls in line. I'm that bitch trying to reclaim my time. I'm that bitch trying to ground like a fist pound. I'm that bitch that's down to drown. I'm that bitch fueling flame with feather. I'm that bitch cloud chasing like weather. Sometimes I taste like sugar. Sometimes shit is sweet. Thank you. That was great. That was great. That was a great uh, closer for our first round robin set from our three poets this evening, Steve Hen, Brooke Nicole Plummer, and Bree Joanne. We're going to have a, another musical interlude with Sam Newsom. We'll get him back on here momentarily. Here's Sam. All right, take it away, Sam Newsom. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Sam Newsom. And you definitely blew some minds out here tonight with your uh, synth wave saxophone. It was amazing. We'll have a uh, we'll have a final piece from Sam here in a little bit. Let's have our next round from our readers. What we're going to do now is uh, we're going to do another round robin. And uh, I will introduce uh, each poet on this uh, next round. And then they're immediately going to turn around and do a, uh, each one of them is gonna do a final poem after this next round. So um, uh, first up in this next round, Steve Hinn. Hey everybody. Wow, Sam, holy cow, man. That is some crazy stuff. Um, I switched plans here. I'm decided I'm gonna I'm gonna do one long poem. That's probably all I'll have time for this round. Uh, this one uh, just got published recently online uh, at a place called Black Coffee Review. Uh, it's about our. It starts out about our dog Emma and other dogs that we have. Dogs we have right now. It's called Elegy for the Family Dog. When we suffered the youth of Emma, she would dash out any time it was warm, run the neighborhood as if driven by a lashing of reckless joy of abandon, until one day she dashed and I took after. I'd been playing basketball weekly and was closer to soccer playing shape than I'd ever be again, and I staked my authority on running her down. She went a while and I went after, and she'd jog and I'd jog and she'd dash and I'd dash, and eventually her spirit broke or her lungs had given all they could. She stood panting, waiting for me. Come on, I hollered, pointing toward the house. And she trotted ahead. I was her master now. From now on, when I barked, she listened. Princess, Emma's mother, was one reason why Lydia and I loved each other. We liked nothing better when she was pregnant than filching a leash, leash from the doggy detritus at her mother's house, walking Princess in the park, a sweet dog. She greeted us with the sweetness we wanted to feel for each other, an avatar for the sweetness we felt. Even though Lydia stabbed me with a fork once sitting at Diggs Diner as if testing to see if there was a link and an end to my love, and how could we know there would be? Princess had puppies and we waited for our own pup, the daughter dubbed Buppy, as a diminutive. The girl who at three years old loved burger cheese and chasing a llama around a field. With her, we took Emma into our modest house with three bedrooms we'd fill with ourselves and three more eventual children and the band practice space in the basement and the gutters we waited so long to clean helicopter seeds sprouted maples in the stuck fermenting leaves. With family and animals, Lydia always wanted more, bigger. So we took a brown poodle mix called chocolate from her mother, like we'd adopted the hapless foil in the family sitcom who always got treated like an asshole, even when innocent. Even Emma disliked chocolate and Emma was a reflection of ourselves. So Emma, middle-aged, still too much a puppy, still excitable, tried so often to sneak through the gaps in the plastic fenced poop yard. We had a handyman chicken wire the interior side but yet chocolate would get out. The little bitch would not be caught and so would not be ruled. And during Lydia's third pregnancy, when Luke was booting at the womb wall from the inside, chocolate was sent back to Lydia's mother's. To befriend googly-eyed Roman, the old weirdo Zaya loved, a blue and white dog with one dark eye and one crazy white one. But he was a sweetheart in the way an old gentle dog can be looking up with his crazy face, asking to be loved. Not exactly cute, not exactly hideous. Isn't that the way it is, Lydia might say, or she might prefer ain't. Her spoken grammar embarrassed her. For years, she used a made up word for a bad mood, sturly. My mom was pretty sturly, so I took off. It wasn't that I wanted or didn't want to be cruel, not telling her it wasn't a real word. I just didn't want to negotiate the fallout, the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. The oh God, what the fuck is wrong with me theatrics I expected. Then a year or two before her death, she discovered Sterly was her invention and asked why I never said anything. But we were divorced by then. I made an effort not to love her anymore. When Lydia died, my only public emotion was anger, was drinking. 
Our kids didn't know how to carry their sadness. I wasn't modeling anything worth imitating. Then the first sober summer since Lid died, four years later, they talked me into a dog. We test walked shelter strays. The first time a total disaster, two hounds, Dan and Ann, sniffed along the perimeter of the building as if detecting bombs. A third was chilled, casual, respected a walk, but went nuts with predator instinct by the small dog pens, almost tore my arm off. A shelter person took the, person took the leash, also got knocked on her ass. But we went back and met a beagle with a tattooed S in her ear. And she was so anxious, so nervous, so eager to please. And right now I'm so glad she's not barking. After we had her a few months, Franny caught me mumbling in my sleep about how she's my soul brother. The shelter called her Liberty, but we renamed her Libby. We didn't want to seem like the kind of people who would name an anxious beagle probably rejected as a hunting dog, Liberty. And now she's barking loud and friendly at Oren's bedroom door while Luke and his friends play D&D, and 90s indie rock is on the record player. This dog, too, will sit at the window and look for the kids to come back from wherever they are. As Emma used to, as hapless chocolate used to, so many dogs we've outlived or haven't, we must be like gods to them. We must be some mighty beings of power and warmth who never falter. That's the only one I got. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Next, let's have Bree Joanne. Great. All right. So um, this next poem is from Radioactive Motes Deluge. And it was edited at the time by uh, Paul Cunningham, who I met when me and my husband were on our honeymoon tour when we were promoting an album he made and a, a little chat book I made. But yeah, Paul is really cool and uh, Deluge is really cool. And he's now the editor of Action Books, which is also really cool. Just go small presses. This is called Salad Roughly. It's hard for me to put together a substantial day. When I'm lost, I tell myself to drink a glass of water. I go to the co-op grocery store and touch vegetables with alternative colors, but they levitate just out of reach, just out of context. I frame the air in front of me with two L's made of my hands, but it's difficult to color what I see, difficult to write a caption. During the most important times in my life, I found myself repelled by my camera phone. But if my feet look interesting as I lay on my back with them pressed against the wall, I tend to obsess. I want to nurture this body. I want to intrigue this mind. I want to hold the warrior pose without getting dizzy. I'd like to clean my room, but every home I take on has a vapor that makes me sink into the nearest horizontal surface, staring at multiple screens while I struggle with what to do with my hands. I end up making couscous in the rice cooker and mixing it with bagged salad from Trader Joe's to eat in the dark. I end up writing a worry list that I'll probably forget about tomorrow. Okay. Uh, this next one is called Paper Cranes on a Seal. And it's, it's long, but it's not long. It's um, from the Burning House Press. Um, and Olivia Kronk was editing and uh, yeah, she's awesome. So paper cranes on, um, actually the whole piece is called Extreme, Extra Extreme Abstractions Home Edition. And the theme for like the month that Olivia was editing was the gaudy domestic. And that just like, I don't know. I just like, I love the idea. So the first part is called Paper Cranes on a Seal. When the package comes, I unpack it. I hold its contents up in the yellow kitchen light, read each thoughtful history and suggestion for use. Then out tumbles the ephemeral. And then out tumbles the ephemeral. Here are the things I didn't know how to want. I fingered the delicate pretenses of flight, give each gift a home of dust, 
and cracked paint. I point out the window to share the view I'd achieved. Out there, cars stop, choose a direction, then follow through. My stomach grumbles. You know ghosts always gossip at the crossroads. The cranes and I almost ignore it. As a sleepy kid in my mom's arms while she fiddled with her keys, I asked questions like, when am I going home? And why does my skin feel like a burden? It's hard to keep solid containment, a place to relish in stasis. It's best to forget the unfinished maps and unsigned contracts. Salt lamp in the castle. My son forms at a faster rate than I. As he falls asleep, he can stare at the gentle inferno shining from his wooden castle. One time, my mom put a green bulb in her Tiffany lamp. The furniture conspired with tabloid horrors in the shadows. The infinite space of the world dawned with reckless cruelty. Out there, at that very moment, people were choosing oblivion over the Iron Maiden of the present. Out there, toxic relics preserved insidious histories. Darkness ceased to be an adventure. Night crouched outside of nursing homes and shopping malls alike. My son cries out at night sometimes. His expressions, even in waking, are often ciphers. All I can do is like the electric wick and hope the fog is merciful to his lengthening bones. All closets, oh, this next was, uh, this next part is art supplies in the closet. All closets are for hopes and secrets. Here is the toy that was too loud. Here are the Christmas decorations hidden to forget that this time of year is inferior. The acrylic paints glow serene under the naked bow. Any day now, I could continue my series of anxious fictional foliage, or I could resume my diary comics. Not right now though. I just came to put a small shirt in the Goodwill bag and to worry about how to dispel the old car seat. Hall closets are legendary. There's a whole Buzzfeed list about the board games behind the whispers in Royal Tenenbaums. Out of sight, does the mind build solace to weft the worries? Comic books in the filing cabinet. Shout out to the old me, a saint sending alms to future hearts impoverished by lost tax papers. Cross-legged in a nest of stress before my altar to bureaucracy, I sink into nostalgia. I remember lying in bed with a stack of artsy comics. I remember my carefully curated playlists. I remember the solo dolor as the ends of wits crackled. Vaudeville villains of days gone landed on my chest, twiddling wax strands and awaiting rebuttal. I wandered daymares with sand stung eyes. The polo to my Marco mute and pleading. Intentions are everything. The wind persists and the atmosphere has its own agenda. But a plucky design should seal any crack. It must. I'm, gr I'm grown enough to panic in April. It's time to come up off that covenant. All right, um, I got one more from my book, my baby. All the books don't have banana cats on them. Just my copy has the banana cats. But if you would like a copy, I still have a few. And I'll drop my email and uh, you can uh, pick up a copy of Black Glitter. Uh, for, but it was the last book from Monster House Press, the beloved Bloomington Press. And once again, shout out to Rose Warrenberg and Wendy Spechuk. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll drop the email afterwards. Uh, <laughs> So uh, yeah, this poem is called Dawn Moon. I'm going to order every book that I ever read before I was 13 and build a palatial fort. 
I've always had heavy handed coping mechanisms. Let's go deep into the future that irradiates the ground. I wander the halls of my isolation. There it is eternally night and there are candles lit everywhere. I wander through my redundancies, dusting off exhausted memories. This place is the only thing that is truly inevitable. Loneliness becomes a stagnant legend. I sit on my throne of memories. My head floats over a thick blanket and my ears glitter with jewels. My breath is a pre-recorded loop, something fanciful, powered by steam. Julia, thank you. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Bree. Let us now have Brooke Nicole Plummer. Cool, so I'm gonna bust out my second chat book, Shaggy Frog, it just came out in early January. And uh, I'm gonna be considerate of time and read just a few of them from the book and also because it'd be cool if you read it as well. Um, so here we go. Was my heart ever received and did it glow? Burning weeds in a dark alley, appraising painted nouns in the size of music, out to apprehend some purpose. I distribute myself between practical usage and your full attention. A trade with no length of time, fear and worth to be played with. Hot applications to writing are ungoverned and only ever surrendered to one's own. Come near. Tanked. You think you have mastered it, a somersault into showing all what you are until it comes back in spite of you to knock you down, then post you up like wallpaper along with all the yellow things, dry and tanked like crusted cat piss and beer in the crevice of a standing shower. We've been one and the same in that way. But I can't be in your crew unless my artistic sins are welcomed too. Lemonade income. This morning, I forgot all of my problems through your words and by misbehaving with that check. I spent $20 on gas and a pack of smokes. Imaginary rich bitch. Everything is under control. Licking the winds of self-served step before sleeping on the cushions or playing the acoustic capo third if I'm not too tired after work to at least gaze the blue scripture by the coal-mounted fire where laughter seizes a memory, the memories I need. Consider a weekend on a salt lake, playing cards and drinking grains, 26 miles from the shore. It mutes the behavior of campaigning men and demeans any finances owed. Only inactive skulls know about morality, which is why my group debauches. You know, death is a business transaction, but we 
have bargained time with the sun. And this is my final one. It's called Safeguard. May those who float on waves of pleasure look backwards without regret. The best policy chilling blasts round the heart with youth affording us consolation. Keep painting the mind so our cups stay ever filled. Our handwriting knows of sorrow and of the evening shine. May we never drift from us. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Brooke. Now we're going to do our uh, our lightning round. You guys know the order, but I'll start you off with Steve. Huh? I'm unmuted, right? You're right. unmuted. Oh, sweet. All right. I've got, uh, I'm going to read uh, the last poem in Guilty Prayer. Well, you know, I think I got the order wrong, Steve. Yeah, so did I. That's why we got surprised. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry about that. If if we're okay, Bree, are you uh, are you prepared for? Actually, you should be. You should be up next. Sorry about that. All right, all right. <laughs> all right, cool. Things were, good. Things were going so well. Musical spotlights. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, this last one is called hashtag Dark Academia. And it's a Tumblr tag. Like I got into Tumblr because Twitter and Instagram, even Instagram was bleak in 2020. So I had to return to Tumblr with the kids. And yeah, hashtag dark academia, which is an aesthetic. Here is my little Lacoste skirt. The gator is hiding, but I know it's there. Here are my grungy docks. Maybe next time I'll wear Chelsea boots. Do you see the little pop of stripe peeking out from under my sweater? It's meant to convey a sense of whimsy. Next time, maybe I'll tuck it in. The color story is muted. You might call it sober, but I know better. It's all ivy and tempest and intoxicating passion. Its burn numbs the body. What I'm saying softly is I'm safe to explore, content within this meme. There's no dispute. I'm well swallowed in this discourse. The aesthetic is shallow, problematic even. But when I'm lost in its multitude, I'm no threat. Thank you. You're up, Brooke. Oh, yeah, I was wondering what that was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm inept, like I have no idea, but yep, now I know. Um, this one's called Dawning. The heartbeat is an anxious scripture to be exhumed and told. One that is combing through cultural inquiry that laps the Great Lakes. All of its wintry pumps through the streets, through my teeth that tell. This body is being claimed through old whiskey, sinking into the rhythm of weeping without making a sound. Deeper this threading and tattooing and stripping reading circuits nude to bear all possible crucial tellings. But you are never there when I am brave of tongue. Just the underlying coal keeping me kissed off with sun skewering and elsewhere. It hisses like a thousand monks vibrating their Sanskrit in a far off valley. My body is not a temple, but a crimson building 
fortified by the twin dragons. I want these words to unfurl to you the way light reflects off the cloud gate, the way voltage bubbles up in the overcast, the hybridity of fucked climactically hollowed, holleringly climactic, the shame of you and me. I kiss the air with Charlotte's web as my roommate meticulously photographs shelves of terracotta. Our house is wrapped by umbilical ivy and moth nests. And still, some things will never be the same. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna read the, the last poem in Guilty Prayer. Uh, it's the last poem in the book because it's, it's kind of a dark and difficult book in terms of content or subject matter. And in this one, there's a, a little guarded glimmer of hope in this that, uh, that closes the book. So I'm gonna ruin the end of the book for you if you haven't read it, but you can re-experience it when you read it. This is called Poem Starting in a High School Gymnasium ending with lines borrowed from Modest Mouse. I like how at high school sporting events, fans say go, as in fight, win. Go Tigers, let's go. Like, let's exit this cavernous half empty gym. Let's walk down the access road behind our high school, which people love to say was modeled after a prison. Let's turn at the bridge over the creek into the woods. Let's take off our socks and shoes and wade in the icy November water. The bugs that scoot across the surface are all gone. Look up through the branches at the stars past the half fallen leaves. Look at them winking, winking at you. In this Brisk cold, you almost feel whole. Only they know how lucky you are. Only they know what could have happened to you. No one on earth will acknowledge the hell that happened years ago when you were young, reckless, and intent on nothing so much as dissipation. But we can't expect people to extend themselves too much, can we? When they see it happening from a distance, their solution is to grow more distant. But not the stars, which might be looking out for you. Might even be editing the final cut, your happy ending. Ain't that something? Ain't it grand to think that what happened was supposed to happen and you survived and God, the filmmaker, never stopped loving you? Because the stars, they're projectors, yeah, projecting our lives down to this planet Earth. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Steve Hen. It's a great closer. I want to thank our uh, three poets for joining us this evening. We're going to have a closing number from a uh, short closing number from Sam Newsom here in a moment, but I wanted to uh, take a moment to thank our three poets, uh, Bree Joanne, Steve Hen, and Brooke Nicole Plummer for joining us this evening. Um, of course, uh, be sure to check out Steve's new book, Guilty Prayer, uh, just out from uh, Main Street Rag and uh, Brooke Nicole Plummer's new book, uh, Shaggy Frog from Alien Buddha Press. Um, yeah. So uh, let's have a let's have a closing number from Sam. Let's get him hooked up here momentarily, and then I'll come back and uh, have a few final words and bid you all good evening. How you doing there, Sam? There he is.
Yeah. Thank you, Sam Newsom. Fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, that was great. That was great. Very nice ending. Thank you so much. So that's going to do it for this evening, folks, for our March edition of the Writers Guild Spoken Word Series. I want to thank, once again, thank our poets, Bree Joanne, Steve Henn, Nicole, uh, excuse me, Brooke Nicole Plummer, and the incomparable Sam Newsom, our musical guest for this evening. Also want to give a special shout out to the man behind the scenes, Kyle Kwas, our musical director, our technical director, our technical music director. Um, he's the guy uh, who mans the, he's the, he's the bouncer at the velvet rope that lets you in the waiting room. He does all the switching of screens and whatnot. Uh, and he's a fantastic human being and uh, got us in touch with Sam. So kudos to Kyle and thank you so much. And uh, so be sure to uh, check out our website uh, for announcements and whatnot, or friend us, follow us, like us, mash that subscribe button, whatever it is you need to do on various platforms to keep up to speed on what we're doing. And be sure to come back next month on Wednesday, April 7th, where we will feature three more readers uh, that will, um, next month will be uh, Joan Hawkins, uh, K.H. Bauer and Abogunde. I believe they are reading excerpts from a soon to be published novel called Rape Escapes. Um, and our uh, special guest, our musical guest, uh, we're doing something a little different this time. Uh, we're going to have some performance films by dancer and filmmaker Valeria De Castro. Um, that she is, uh, they're, they're, they are still in the works, but they are going to be done. I've seen two or three of them and, and she's an amazing performer. I'm looking forward to the films as well. So that's Wednesday, April 7th, uh, right back here at six o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Um, thank you so much for being here. Folks on the Zoom, feel free to hang out for a little bit. I'm gonna close off, uh, close down here on Facebook and thank you all very much. Vaccines are coming. I just got mine scheduled today. Got my first one scheduled today. Woohoo. So um, everybody stay safe, continue being safe and continue being kind to each other. And uh, we'll all get through this together. Thanks and have a good night.